Good evening, Lompo. Good evening, Shunsin. Greetings, everyone. Uh, let's all pay our respects to Lompo with three bows together. Bow. So, Beta, shall we do some meditation? Yes, please, Lord Paul. That's the plan. Okay, half an hour? Yeah? Yes, please. Thank you. I'll, I'll give a bit of instruction and then we'll do the practice in silence. <clears throat> so the usual ideas that I like to present establish presence by listening to sound so just listen to sound and notice the silence when you make that intention the silence of knowing So the reference is more to the silent knowing rather than to the quality of sound. So we're more concerned about the awareness to abide as witness. So the silent knowing is always there, the sounds change. I'll do the same with the feelings in the body. So just feel your hands, change the sense base, feel the tactile impressions on your hands. Let them come to you. And there's the silent knowing. Listen to sound. And perceive sound as in awareness. Rather than the sound is out there. That whole perception of sound out there is in awareness. And there's the silent knowing. Feel the hands. Same thing. The hands and feelings in the hands are in awareness. Go to the center of your chest, feel the rising and falling of the breath at the chest, and stay with this silent knowing. So it doesn't really matter what you feel at the chest, it's the silent knowing that we are kind of concerned with. Then bring in a, an attitude of kindness and loving kindness. So on the in-breath, at the center of the chest, name or visualize a person whom you have affection for and let that name remind you of a feeling of affection. So if I think of my teacher, Lompo, Lompo Sumedho, on the in-breath, I name him. 
Lung Po. And it's more than just a word. It has a, it evokes a feeling of affection and gratitude. So Lung Po. And then on the out breath, may you be well. And let go of the name of the person and just get a sense of welcoming on the in-breath. Letting go on the out-breath with that sense of affection. So you're welcoming everything in, letting go of everything out. So it's very open, receptive, And notice the silence of awareness. So during the meditation, use the chest if you want, the expansion and contraction of the chest with the breathing as a kind of grounding principle. Use attitudes of, of affection. So it's very welcoming, opening. And most importantly, notice the silence of awareness. And then when you get caught up with thinking, then it's natural. Um, return to that, that silent knowing of something, be it the breath or the sound in the room. Keep remembering the silence of awareness. And then sustain that with one in breath, one out of breath, with this very open attitude. So you're not controlling or trying to get rid of thought, but actually you're noticing the silence between thoughts. All right, let's let's just use that and sit quietly.
Okay. So thank you, Lumpo. We'll now request for a Dharma talk. Brahma Jaloka Dipati Sahampati. Namo Tassa, Papa Watu, Warahato, Sama, Samputasa, Namo Tassa, Papa Watu, Warahato, Sama, Samputasa, Namo Tassa, Papa Watu, Warahato, Sama, Samputasa, Utang Damang Sankan, Namasa. So, hello again. When was Beta? When was the last time we had? A session. It was uh, before Long month. before Long Paul's birthday. Aha. Uh -huh. One. So uh, we've had the the great honor of Long Paul visiting us, and uh, he's uh, he's my teacher and a good friend, and I've known him since nineteen seventy four, I think. So it's been a long and fruitful friendship. And he was here with us for a few weeks. And then we took him on a trip to Newfoundland. I don't know if you're all familiar with Newfoundland. Newfoundland's an island off the East Coast, the Atlantic coast of Canada. It's, I think I looked it up. I think it was half the size of Malaysia. So it's a serious island and uh, it has maybe half a million people. And uh, New Newfoundland was closed during the two years of the COVID pandemic. And they pulled a lot of the resources for tourism off the island, such as rental cars. So we had to rent a car in Ottawa and then Myself and my our trusty Stuart Nirasa, we drove three days, it was over 2,000 kilometers to get to St. John's. And St. John's is the capital of Newfoundland. In the meantime, <clears throat> Lopo Semedo had his birthday here. And then he and Ajahn Asoko uh, and Libun, yeah. Yom Vibun flew out to Newfoundland and we met them there. And then we did a car tour of Newfoundland and it's, it's a, an exquisite island. The colors are beautiful and the architecture is interesting. It's obviously very wild. Canada does wild very well. And, uh, and then just to be with Lompo and Ajahn Asoko and Vibun and Nirasso over those two weeks was really very, very special. And then we uh, drove, we took the ferry from the island back to Nova Scotia, then went and took Ajahnasoka and Lone Paul to Halifax. He flew to Boston to be a temple monastery. And then we drove back uh, over three days back to Tisserna. So that was uh, five and a half thousand kilometers of driving. Uh, so it was, uh, I, I was just a passenger, I was just hanging in there, so it was very easy for me. 
Canada is a, is a, and that's just, this is just the east side of the Canada. So if, for the, some of you might know Ajahn Punadamo, um, he is uh, in the same province as I am, Thunder Bay. So he's at the top of Lake Superior. And I think if you drove to his place, it's like 20 hours of driving. That's north. So it's, it's, the, 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 the spaces of Canada are really, really quite, quite marvelous and wonderful. So I'm all fired up for having been with, with Long Paul. He's, uh, he's 88 now, and uh, he has balance issues, but his mind is very, very clear. So it's his talking Dhamma and sharing Dhamma is, is just an absolute uh, pleasure and privilege. And for those of you who listen to his teachings, you know that his teachings are very, very direct. And quite often he will simply say, it's like this. How many, you know, we've all heard that so many times. And it seems like the most obvious thing, it is obvious. And how could it be otherwise? But the thrust of that statement is to bring your mind to silence. Now, if you don't get that, then it's just a sort of truism. It's like this. Um, and then the mind just keeps thinking. That's not what he, I would say, that's not what he's doing. He's not defining this moment as being like this. He's saying, it's, if you use that statement yourself, it's like this. And then you bring your mind to a sense of attention, then you notice the silence of awareness. And I would say that's what he's trying to point to. Now, that might not seem like much, but try to sustain that 24-7. Try to sustain that silent knowing for long periods of time, and we see how, what a challenge that could be. There are the kind of three ways that we were talking, I was talking with Lone Paul about silence, and we came up with, from other teachers and our own considerations, um, three ways of thinking about silence. One is obviously the silence of, of circumstance. So when I came back to the monastery, the silence of the monastery is very impressive. After having been in a car for so many uh, hours and days and then being in restaurants and such like, so there's the silence of a situation that there's no traffic or no one's talking. And I think as meditators, we really appreciate that. Uh, but that silence is, is, it's constructed, it's dependent on what happens. So if there's loud noises, that silence disappears. And then there's the silence between thoughts. And that's what I think Lompo is asking us to do when, when he says it's like this. Now, if you, if you then take that further into thought, then I don't think you're following his suggestion. It's like this. And that takes you to the silence after that thought. It's like this. And noticing that silence, I think, then is the gateway to the deeper silence of liberation. When Lone Paul opens his talks, his formal talks, quite often uses a poly formula within which there's the phrase that the doors to the deathless are open. And, and the doors to the deathless are, are, are not thought. I would say it's the silence of knowing the silence of awareness. Because thought itself can be useful to bring you to that point. But thought itself is a construct. And if it's misused, then we are always in the thinking mode of trying to figure something out or strategizing or practices, whatever. And 
what Lompo has always emphasized to me about Theravada Buddhism is that it's not a dogma. It's not a doctrinal thing that you take on as a package in, in opposition to other packages of doctrine. Theravada versus Mahayana or Theravada versus Christianity or Theravada versus Advaita or these kinds of things. It's not something you hold on to as a bunch of concepts that are right because you are a Theravada Buddhist. Rather, they are for reflection. And reflection is the ability to use a bunch of ideas that a teacher might present to you to explore the nature of consciousness, the nature of your own suffering, the nature of being who you are, um, the nature of the mind, the nature of the emotions. So it's a question kind of teaching. Now, the questions aren't just abstract, you know, just like the thing I often talk about is where someone, and I've mentioned this so many times, it was such a good example. Someone asked me if Buddhist teaching on dependent origination proved or disproved Darwinian theory of evolution. And I said, I don't care. <laughs> I'm not here for some kind of scientific answers. I'm here to understand the liberation of the heart. So that, that way of using a doctrine, comparing, it might have some importance in academia, sure. But our questioning is, is, is very existential. It's about my existence. And what is it that the Buddha realized? And what is it in me that, could, that I could do to perhaps come to that realization? So the Buddha's presentation of the teaching is a kind of presentation of, uh, of faith. He says, the texts tell us what he says is there's the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unborn, deathless, Nibbana, the island, peace, the harbor, this whole set of words which point to a possibility in human consciousness. And then you could believe that or disbelieve that. If you take it on faith, you know, this man has realized something and maybe you meet a teacher who you think has also realized it. So for me very much, Lompo Sumedho or, or Lompo Cha, they've touched something profoundly silent, profoundly compassionate, and I'm interested in that. So then the teaching is, is, is like trying to get you to look at your own experience so that you understand your experience, so that you incline your efforts and your thoughts and your whole life towards this possibility of enlightenment and freedom. If you just take it as a doctrine, then you just have a viewpoint, a Buddhist viewpoint as opposed to another viewpoint. It's not wrong. It, it, it'll be a moral viewpoint for sure. It'll be a viewpoint which encourages generosity, which are very, very important things. But viewpoints themselves are simply states of mind, right? They, they, they're, they're constructs. So we were joking around, Long Paul and I, about the Noble Eightfold Path. And so I said, Lopo, so what do you think right view is? He said, no view. <laughs> right view is no view. Now, now why, you know, you have to have some practice to kind of take that on board, but you can see how in this world of views and opinions now, how much violence there is around opinions, whether it's about vaccines or all kinds of just in this human capacity to hate other humans for their viewpoints. But that's not very, very liberating. So then I asked him, well, okay, right view is no view. What about right understanding? So he says, well, right understanding, it's like this. <laughs> and that's true, right? It is like this. And again, to do that, to do that, you have to be silent. And trusting in that silence or even touching it, 
I think is a big step in human spiritual evolution as individuals. Because quite often when I meet people who ha don't have refuge, who don't have a spiritual kind of dimension to their life, then they're just very much caught by the storylines of who they are in a world which is very unsatisfactory. And they're just caught in these viewpoints and opinions and views and so on. There's no, no freedom. So <laughs> right understanding is it's like this. Why is it difficult to sustain that silent knowing? Why is it difficult? Well, it's difficult because the material, the content of it's like this is quite often not nice, not fun, not pleasant not beautiful, it's quite often ugly or painful or confusing or whatever. So the contents, the sense content, the, the material that we are faced with doesn't fit our desire patterns. The world is not constructed to satisfy my desire point, obviously. No? So then to, to take that statement, it's like this, and silently, witness unfulfilled desire, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. And yet, and yet, if we are willing to witness desire as an object, not become the subject of that, not, not try to get rid of, just know it, unfulfilled desire feels like this, then we come to the cessation of desire, the not wanting, desirelessness. And that's another way that we talk about liberation, because the heart which has no, no, it has, we have biological needs. I want my kids to be happy. I want, I don't have any kids actually, <laughs> but you know what I mean. I want the, the community to be well. So sure, that's just natural kind of wanting, but there's a, there's a kind of deeper wanting that we have as human beings, which is we, we don't know who we are or, or, you know, it's like an existential kind of wanting. It's different than the biological wanting. And, and, and that's what we really need to look at. And a sense of I'm not perfect or I need to be something else or I need to do something else. This, this kind of yearning in the heart and the practices of it's like this include looking at, oh, desire feels like this. And then, and then the cessation of desire feels like this. And that liberating um, cycle of, of experience, because it is liberating, brings you to this deeper silence. So we begin with right understanding. It's like this. And then I asked Long Paul, all right, so <laughs> how do you do effort? What's right effort? So, of course, he says to me, well, right effort is no effort. Oh, come on. We're not doing anything. But actually, you try that. Try that. Try to sit, uh, sit in a room, your room, and just sit there, and it's like this, and see how difficult it is to just do that, because your mind will want to get something from. It's like this. You want to get something from your meditation, or you want to get rid of something, or you want to understand something, or blah 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 blah. And actually, it's very, very difficult. You just try, just, just sit in your chair, forget about meditation, forget about all the techniques you do and all of that, forget about enlightenment. Just, it's like this. How long can that be sustained? That silent knowing. Of course, what happens is you feel discomfort or you have a memory of someone that said something to you and the, your attention gets all kind of caught up in being a person in the past and the future. So what would no effort mean in that? What does no effort mean? Well, it's, it's not the effort to become or get rid of. And when we talk about tanha and craving, I, I assume that everyone has a, a fairly good working knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. So bhava tanha is that, that driven energy in humans to become something. Vibhava tanha is that, that rejection of, of what is. And these are very fundamental structures of how the sense of self gets reignited, reborn constantly. 
So, so to make no effort, when you're witnessing something like uh, self-criticism, to say self-criticism feels this way, it's like this, not to try to fix it, not to try to get another state of mind, but to actually know self-criticism, it's like this. And to sustain that for long periods of time is very difficult. So there is an effort there. There is an effort to sustain but it's not to get rid of or to become. And what happens when you do that, then the very nature of say something like self-hatred or self-disparagement, that ceases. It ceases in the silence of the mind because it's not you who you are. It's not permanent. And that is the way of insight where you're willing to witness some discontent and suffering that you're facing. And you're really will actually willing to be with it. What's this really like to feel disgruntled or, or, or worried about something or fearful about something. And this is all around what we call Chitanopasana. It's the third foundation of mindfulness. It's the mood of the mind, the, 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 the tone of the mind. So a worried mood is different than an excited mood. Uh, an angry mood is different than a loving mood. And these moods of the mind, then we don't tend to notice them. We tend to be driven by the thoughts associated with them. So if I feel resentment for something that someone said to me, I plug into all the, all the resentments I've had before, the patterns and habits of resentment. And I find that a sense of self gets reborn. It shouldn't, it's not fair. They did this to me and I was good to them and I'm never going to forgive them. And, and the mind creates a sense of a self. If you can then notice that package and they say, oh, it's like this, resentment's like this, and then bear witness to it, that takes, uh, that takes trust, I would say. And it's the trust that that's not who you are, that you don't have to fix this or get rid of it. You have to witness it. And if the habit is always to try to fix it and analyze it, even with meditation, you never really resolve it. You might push it to the side for a while, but if you really open to it with a kind of open awareness and, and feel the, the uncomfortable of it, what you're doing is you're not following the desire pattern, the ego pattern, the self pattern, just knowing it as a sankara, as something that's arisen. That's hard to do. It's very hard to do. And yet what else is there to do? So one of the one of the phrases that Lopo has been using a lot in the sense of, of effort is openness. I think we all use that. So what does it mean to feel open to something like resentment? Well, you really let it be there, you let it you welcome it into the consciousness. Then you're the witness. You're the witness that knows change, and that's the silence of knowing. Can I come to the silence of knowing when the like when I suggest to you, uh, listen to sound. Easy enough, unless the sound is really raucous. Just listen to sound and notice that silence, the silence of awareness. And train in that until you can do that when someone something happens that is emotionally disturbing. On this trip, Lopo Semedo lost three close friends. One was his sister. The reason he, one of the reasons he came to the States was to see his sister who is 90 years old. You might have heard already, but he went to visit her in Seattle, Washington. They're very close. And um, she was, he was with her over four days. And during that time, she already started to, her, her vital signs were already starting to look like they're failing. He was with her for four days. He went down to Abayagiri. She died just two days after he had seen her. It's almost like she was waiting for him. He went back to the funeral in Vancouver, Washington, got COVID came back. Then when he was here, a very good friend of the monasteries, Kunying Noi Thompson, 
died in Chiang Mai, and she was one of the great supporters of Chitters. She was, I think, also like 90 years old. She died. And then when we were in Newfoundland, George Sharp, who was the chairperson of the English Sangha Trust that started, that invited us to England early on, a very important person in our lives and in Lompa Semedo's life, also late 80s, phoned up Lompa and said he had an aneurysm. And the doctor said, he's got maybe six months to live. Lompa talked with him on the phone. The next day, George died. So three very, very, very significant losses in Lompa's life. And he certainly felt it. I mean, he's a human being. And you could see that was, that was quite strong. But all the time, what's he saying? Well, it's like this. Sorrow is like this. Grief is like this. And it's, it's, there's something very beautiful about seeing your teacher feeling grief and sorrow, but not neither rejecting that emotional part of being human, but also not being lost in it. It's like this. So we're reflecting a lot on birth and death. And that's what refuge is. You can see what refuge is, that place in our hearts of witnessing that can be with the naturalness of death, with the naturalness of loss. Because they are, they are natural things. It's very difficult. Silence is very difficult, isn't it? Thought is easy. And, and, and this is the predicament, I think, of, of being contemplative or a meditator, you can sometimes certainly suppress thought. You can hold on to an object and, and kind of subdue the thinking mind. But then when you let go of the object, then the thinking mind starts to well up again in its old habits and patterns. So what we're, I, I would say what we're doing as meditators is we're not trying to create silence or get silence by getting rid of something else. But silence is important, but I would say we're trying to actually notice silence, that it's always a possibility. It's always a possibility. And that's why we talk about the space between thoughts. So Lompa was, was uh, we were re reminiscing as we do as old monks, we reminisce about practices we've done rather than um, other things. <laughs> So he was re just reminding me that for, for there was a, a time in his practice where he would just use the word I or I am, I. Now that, you know, that's a pretty ordinary word. But what happens when you do that? What happens if you just take the word I and just say it in, into, in, into the ether, I. Well, when you say that word and you don't follow it with anything else, I'm Sumedo, I'm Viridamo, I'm a man, I'm a monk, and any kind of definition, there is just presence and silence. And I would, I would say that, that that silence is really what we, we are trying to notice and be with, because that silence is really where insight has a chance to arise. Um, and it's, it is the gateway to that deeper silence, which is transcendent realization. So these are the kinds of practices Long Paul had, has always encouraged me in as, as, a, as a younger monk. And now is these, these kind of curious questions that we might put to ourselves that actually bring us to silence. Or just a statement, I. Now that might not seem very, very fruitful, but so you have to do it. So let's say you are caught up in some kind of emotional turmoil of something and you can, you have enough presence to say, emotion feels this way, it's like this. That's a big step. And then you start to witness the very I language in there because that's, that's what attachment is about. It's the story, the narrative on top of the jitta, on top of the type of mindset. So there's the feeling of, of being annoyed. And then we take it further and we, we develop a whole story and narrative. And that's what we mean by attachment. 
not the annoyance itself. Annoyance is annoyance. Fear is fear. These are these are natural phenomena. But it's the whole complex thinking of me and mine, me and mine. And then you 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 have the presence of mind to see all that story. You say I. And you cut into that, not to get rid of it. Now, that's very, very powerful, whereas quite often what we do is we just start to analyze it. Why am I like that? I shouldn't be like that. Well, yeah, but that's, and, and we just think more. We go off into thinking, but how would you bring your, your mind to, to, to silence within an emotion? So the emotion can be quite energetic, but you can just say, I. And then listen to that silence. And as you start to do that, then you, you really you see how the sense of becoming or trying to get rid of is a whole this, this whole language of desire and judgment and I. You kind of start to break into it with this. It's a very compassionate thing. It's not like shut up, you're a dumbo. Stop thinking. I want silence. It's not that. It's actually like opening I. And then there is there is the pain or the complexity or the nothingness of it, I. It's very elegant, very simple, and it takes trust to do these kinds of practices. And you can see it's the same as it's like this. It's the same kind of suggestion. And then there's the silence. There's the silence. We trust in thought. We trust in doubt. We trust in, in thinking a lot, unfortunately. Um, we need thought. See, thought can be very, very helpful. Um, so then I asked Lopo, what about right thought? Of course, what did he say? No thought. <laughs> what else would he say to me? <laughs> no thought. And that, you know, that's a profound, that, that silence is a profound aspect of, an important aspect, I would say, of our, of our, of our spiritual work is to remember it's like this or I, and then make that who you really are, that silence, that witnessing silence, who you are, rather than your personal histories or your all your identities. They come and go, they come and go as, as thoughts, but this sense of presence, that's always there. Silence is always there. Witnessing is always possible. So we turn, and that's why my tendency to, when I'm talking about meditation, is to not put so much emphasis on the object of awareness, but back on the awareness itself. So when I ask you to listen to sound and then notice the silence of knowing, it doesn't matter about the sound. When I ask you to feel the breath, it doesn't matter about the breath, it's the silence of knowing. And if you get into the habit of, of doing that, then that becomes a, a powerful factor for remembering to operate that way when things are more complex or more difficult or more painful. And then that becomes refuge. And that can handle anything. It can handle anything because it's not dependent on emotions or feelings or whatever. And then if you trust in that silence, then that silence takes you to the deeper silence of transcendence or ineffable peace or whatever language you like to use. All right, I think that's sufficient for contemplation. Any questions, anyone? Andamayam o Vadagata Sadu Karankadama Se Sadu 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 Anumodami. Joey, you have a question. Yes, Joey. Yes, please unmute Joey. Crap, Namaskar. Nice to see you, Joey. Good, good to see you. that big trip. You're fading out on me. Is that me or you? I think I think it's me. Oh, cool. okay. Not me, not mine. Don't worry. Um, I have a question about about see of practicing. Um, I know you encourage us to do a morning practice, and I, I think I have that down. But when it when it gets to the afternoon, when it gets to the evening, 
the restlessness, the sleepiness just gets the better part of me. Do you have any advice about frequency of, of uh, practice, how, how we can do it more often throughout the day? Yeah, that's, that's very important. Um, well, you're, you're limited by your livelihood, what you can and can't do. So you want to soberly look at your livelihood and say, really, how, how much of this do I need to do constantly? And how much of this could I break up? in a different pattern so that I could basically do nothing for some period of time. Because the, the modern culture, urban culture is complex and the, the interplay with the media and doing and thinking is so relentless in a day that obviously you feel exhausted, right? Whereas normally if you're using your body more like if you're doing making furniture, whatever, you use your body for a while and then you put it all down, you sit, you have a cup of tea and then you start up again. But the nature of modern work with computers is that thought analysis is constantly being stimulated. And if it's not that, then it's just a stimulation of media. So how can you step out of that constant stimulation and exhaustion of the mental faculties. Um, I don't know, but you, you, know, you, you look at your, your, your lifestyle and you say, well, actually, um, I could pause somewhere. And, and, and you, then you make that pause one where you try to get out of the environment of stimulation that you're in or environment of responsibility. I mean, obviously, you you can go for a walk, but I don't know how good it is to go for a walk in Bangkok. It's not like going for a walk here. Um, but breaking breaking the patterns is, is, is very, very important. And then I would say body movement, qigong or tai chi or yoga or, or something where you have to be like tai chi and qigong are good because they're very fluid and they really loosen. And, and then you have to be with the body. So getting out of the whole thinking processes and the analytical processes and that, but do accept that you're going to, you know, evening meditation is much more difficult. I think for most people than morning meditation, because you are exhausted and you've been over, over, overstimulated. And um, I mean, retreats are good. So I know you hopefully you'll be coming for this retreat here in Ontario. Those are very good. They break up a year, a year's pattern. Um, a lot of people do, like they keep the eight precepts for, on, a, on, a, on a Sunday and they do a, a media fast. That's, uh, you know, that's quite common now among, among uh, Buddhist practitioners where they, they just put all the devices away for, for 12, 24 hours, which is like very difficult for people. Um, so, so those kind of strategies, usually you, 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 you learn those from other lay people who are practitioners because you're in the same environment and you have the same challenges. So if you have any practitioners who are very diligent in a practice of their own at home, they have self-discipline and so on, then you kind of pick their brains. Uh, when you when you do a retreat and you come off the retreat, then you've got a really interesting moment in your life where you will now see how you pick up the world. You'll see the habits of the way you pick up the world. And that's very, very valuable. You can learn a lot in that interspace between the end of the retreat and the beginning of your normal routines. And you'll see how I don't know what, but you'll see how you get caught up with things. And that's a time where a lot of insight about having a lifestyle that suits meditation more, those insights come up. Having said that, you're in a culture which is not interested in enlightenment. It's more interested in consumption. Um, although you look, work a lot with Lompa uh, organization that, you know, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on, 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 
getting stuff done and producing and so on. So you have to be pretty strong not to get too caught up in that. And the way to do that is just to get out of it, do retreats, come to the monastery, and then the morning meditation. And over time, you you you, you understand you know, understand yourself better and better, little by little, you get better and better. Because you, you're a very sincere practitioner, and you just that question means that you're looking for ways to, uh, oh, you know, to, to be more conversant with how you get caught up with stuff, and it'll work that way. But those breaks, like retreats, are excellent, excellent, and, and you're going to make the trip here, so, so we won't take your hair, but um, there are those opportunities in Thailand and so on. Um, and you do, you know, you, you have a lot, like, I get, I, one thing to look at is how much, how much of the use of these devices is necessary and how much of it is just compulsive. That, everyone talks about that, don't they? And, and um, what's a reasonable way to use that as a practice? Because what you could do is to, rather than say, I will not use my iPhone or whatever, you could actually say, well, like, I'll use my iPhone. I won't use it for 15 minutes. You play a game like that. And then in those 15 minutes, you could watch the desire to look at your iPhone. Now, if you just say to yourself, I won't use my iPhone, or I won't do this, or I won't do that, that might work, but usually doesn't. You kind of think, well, that was a stupid decision, and you pick up your iPhone. <laughs> but if you, if you actually then have a structure, which is kind of like we have around some of the things we do is you, you have a structure and you say to yourself, okay, this structure means for a half an hour, I'm not going to look at my iPhone. You make that deliberate through your day. And then having said that, you'll see, you want to pick it up and look at any messages that might come. Then you see desire. You see the nature of desire. And then you say, oh, well, desire to look at the iPhone feels like this. Then you're in the sense of presence, which will slow your mind down. If you try to just, just suppress that desire to look at the iPhone, that's not mindfulness. So you should look at the desire to look at your iPhone, and that's a restlessness in the mind, which then exhausts you. Now you just say, oh, wow, that's what that feels like. Do five, ten minutes. And, and, and then you have more mindfulness in a, a kind of a, a structure in the ordinary, most of the times you can't do that. You're so busy dealing with people. But there are there are times where you know you can have those little interspaces. Or if you're like on the on the on the on the overground, the, the tube in, in in Bangkok, say you're going from A to B, um, then you, you you use those times. You must do that, right? You do that to just focus on your breath, calm your mind. All those things chop up that that restlessness that we get from modern culture. But it's yeah, it's it's it's. I think you're the most important thing is your intention. You know, you really want to understand. You want to do this, and that pays dividends. That really that really does work. When are you arriving here? Exactly one month, Kabajan, nineteenth of September. All right, we look forward to it. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, Joey. Julia. There you go. Um, hello, Longpo. Um, thank you for your practice. I live in a small town in Colorado and we have no what. So um, even though I like in person, I just feel so incredibly grateful for this Zoom thing and for Bita and everybody. Um, so I have kind of a two part question, if I may. Please. It's both related to sort of um, a sense of shape and, and space. Um, and I'm wondering how to get more free and if, if this sort of points out any hang ups I can work with. So one, so sometimes when like I actually remember to really practice, um, then 
uh, there's a sense of like sinking down and this huge net of everything just dissolves. And, um, but then when I get kind of more caught up in everyday life comes back, the, the things that come back first in terms of like, um, I know some people don't like the word energetic, but almost like Buddha Rupa shapes um, of like the imagination of, of that subtle body come back first. So that's one thing. And then maybe that's just a, a side effect, but I was wondering if it's nutriment, like because I'm putting myself in the Dharma situation then like is that nutriment that I'm feeding back into what was more free and then the other thing is that it's another visual thing where I was talking to this lay person that I respect who who I respect whom I respect and um I was saying yeah it's neat with the chit and that how like we're all made of these particles and there's space in between and you breathe in and out and the particles like wrap and unwrap and make things happen and in kind of like a Burmese way and he's like Julia you're so visual you really should look at more in in terms of time like how do the Nama and Rupa interact with each other from moment to moment in terms of time he's like sorry I'm not supposed to point you're so spatial so I'm just wondering like do I have a spatial hang up or how to work with those two things? <laughs> That's a, wow, this is the first time I've had this kind of question. Great. Um, <laughs> you know, I am I am the opposite of you. I can't visualize a pencil. <laughs> so we've often talked about I'm pathetic, but it is very quiet. Uh, so, but if, if you go back to something simple like awareness. Yeah. Uh, and awareness of change. Mm -hmm. um, then if you have a lot of, you know, whatever, whatever way your, your inner world is constructed is constructed that way. There's nothing right or wrong of it. And mm -hmm. it's being able to trust in the witnessing of it and then look at the desire patterns which get you caught up in it. So I don't really know because I'm I'm not a visual person. What was what was the language we used? Hey, I'm I'm aphantastic, and you are hyperphantastic. <laughs> I think that's it. Anyway, um, if you if you take the model of the four noble truths, right? Okay, take something that you and I can agree upon. Let's say there's a. Uh, loud argument out on the grass that's a sense experience and i get that and then i don't like it so i want it to go away so i have a version two or it's something really sweet and beautiful and i want to go to it so the attention goes either wants it or doesn't want it so you and i can agree on sound now in the same way with the visual imagery you have there's the witnessing of it, it's like this. And then there's maybe the fascination with it or the involvement with it or yeah. the not wanting of it, right? That's what, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to use the Four Noble Truths, desire and the end of desire, fascination, yeah. whatever it might be, I can't say, and, and use that as a structure. See, where's the real problem here? Now, it might just be doubt. It might be just that your thinking mind creates a doubt about spatial, visual, and all of that, and you're just thinking doubtful thoughts. So um, I, I, I would suggest um, when you have like a lot of thinking, then that's thinking, that's not visual. Okay. That's post-visual, right? So at that moment, that's thought. And just say, oh, this is doubt, I don't know. I don't know. And then from that silence of not knowing, allow the, the experience to reveal itself and see, is there grasping uh, going towards the experience of trying to get rid of it? Can you stay 
present, aware of change in that more complex formulation, which your mind produces, mine doesn't. <laughs> so I, I'm a very dull fellow that way. I'm very kind of, but I think it's, it's quite all right. So look at like, when you start to think a lot of doubts, that's just doubt. You can't figure this out. You don't have to figure it out. You just know doubt feels this way. So the desire pattern around doubt is you want an answer. You want a conclusion. Okay. So then you, you apply the Four Noble Truths to doubt. And that's hard to do because you're just thinking, trying to get an answer. So first of all, you have to label it and say, oh, doubt feels this way. So it's actually not about in that moment, in that instance. It's not so much about the visualization. It's about the thinking mind. So get that right and say, well, I don't know. It's like this. I don't know. And then from that silence, allow the silence to witness how the visual processes work and see, okay, why can't I just witness this has changed? How do I get involved? How does the sense of self get involved? So we inquire that way. Does that make sense? That's super. That's that's like that's like really helpful. The the piece about well, many pieces that working with it is oh yeah, that's just another object. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and and also like maybe when the guy said that, I was like, well, maybe I'm not doing my practice right. You know. Yeah. And so, <laughs> that's that's a Buddhist put down. You know, <laughs> some character has some poly words for you. He doesn't know your mind. And he says, this is what you should do. But it's your mind. You know what you should do, right? And, and then you feel guilty, right? <laughs> or you feel, I'm not doing it right. But that's another sense of self. Yeah. I am someone who is not doing it right. But doing it right is simply awakening. It's like this then you're doing yeah. it right. Yeah, it's like that That worked for me with a long poor in person and, um, and taking refuge, like steering things back with the Four Noble Truths. That's a really that, good idea too. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Julia. That was, a, that was a new one. <laughs> That's really nice, long poor. Okay, Malika. Malika, how are you? Mute, Malika. mute. Malika, unmute you, yourself, Malika. Unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Okay. Anchan, I have a question on this: uh, How to use silence of knowing with your breath? Can you, if you can, just uh, with your with the breath when with you're the using breath. the breath for meditation how do you just uh, use well the... if you if you emphasize the silence of knowing rather than trying to control your mind with breathing so if you're trying to suppress thought yeah. by focusing on an object you might do it for a while but then you're as soon as you stop doing that practice your mind will just generate a lot of thought but if you're just noticing that, oh, the breath feels this way, and in that noticing, there's silence. The in-breath feels like this. There's the silent knowing. The in-breath feels like, the out-breath feels like this. There's the silent knowing. You're emphasizing the awareness rather than the breath. What we do in meditation, not everyone, not all the time, but what we inadvertently do is a thought comes into consciousness you think you're the thinker. You think that you should try to get rid of the thought. And then you put your attention on the breath, trying to get rid of thought, which is all based on, on, a, on a sense of I am the thinker. Whereas that whole sense of I am the thinker, we'd say is another construct. Thinking arises according to causes and conditions. So if you're just trying to get rid of thought by looking at the breath, then I would say, do emphasize awareness first. So whether I hear the sound of the birds outside and I pay attention, there's the silent knowing, or I feel the body and it's breathing, it's the same silent knowing. Do that exercise. Do two sense bases. 
sound, bodily feeling. It's the same silent knowing. Then pick up the breath, but not so much to concentrate and try to focus your mind in a really, really small point, but rather, oh, silent knowing feels like this. Breath feels like this. So you're emphasizing the awareness rather than the breathing. You see what I mean? Yes, I do. Yeah. And, and then also really observe when thoughts come up, what is your first reaction to noticing thinking? Is your first reaction, oh, go, I'm thinking, I have to go on to the breath. Is it just automatically? Then that's really not usually not aware. It's just a kind of knee-jerk reaction because you don't want thinking. So then if there's a lot of thinking, think deliberately. Like you, let's say you're thinking about the grandkids. Oh, then, then stop. You, you think about the grandkids. Take that story another sentence. How are the grandkids today? Then stop and notice the silence of knowing. Then pick up the breath from the silence of knowing rather than from the rejection of thought. You, you see the difference? Yes. So observe when thinking comes up, what's your first reaction to that? And if it's just like, I shouldn't be thinking, then, then usually there's a... There's, it's not mindful. It's a kind of reaction. Thank All you, right? John. Thank you. Very okay. helpful. Yeah. And uh, you can do some uh, uh, distinct transfer merit to mom. To mom. Tomorrow. Thank Tomorrow. You, okay. Yeah. Thank you for your email. Okay. Uh, Be well. Tomorrow. That's right. Yeah. Okay, Bita. Lampo, there's one more question here. Can you take sure. okay. Yes, please. This person is from Australia, Renisha. Uh, her question is, uh, Dear Ajahn, I was meditating in the evening and about five minutes into it, I felt some pressure on the middle of my forehead. The deeper I got into meditation, it started to hurt more. Please, Ajahn, can you please explain what I'm feeling? Oh, well, I don't know. Could be a migraine. Could be a deva kissing you on the forehead. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I suspect uh, it's a phenomenon. That's what we know for sure, right? Source, I don't know. It's a phenomenon. So if, it, if, it's, if it's truly painful, then see a doctor. Um, if it's a migraine, you're probably used to it. Um, but it's just a phenomenon. And the thing about strange phenomena is they're fascinating. Because it's different. You've never had that experience. If, it, if it's kind of creating pressure and a headache, then do walking meditation or, or go have a cup of tea or weed the garden or something like that. You don't have to sit with everything and just sort of endure it. And then just start again. But on a, larger, on a larger question, any experiences in meditation, like if you see lights or visions or, or nimittas or things, they are very fascinating. But the problem is that they change. Anything that began will end. And that cannot be the unconditioned. It cannot be the transcendent by nature. So we get fascinated by that because usually meditation is terribly boring. I think people would agree with that, <laughs> right? There's nothing happening. So something finally happens. It's, wow, something's happening. I'm seeing lights. And, and then, you're, then you're actually more lost because you're, 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 you're attached to a phenomenon. But all phenomena are unsatisfactory. So even, even like lights or visions or nimittas, they arise and they cease. And the witnessing, the ability to witness in silence takes you to a deeper silence. So with this pressure on the head, I would say, if it's bothersome, just walk away from the meditation. If you start to worry about it before meditation, just look at that, well, this is worry, but don't make anything out of it. Don't create anything out of it. Just know it as a phenomenon, as a physical phenomenon. But what it is, I, I, can't, I can't say. Um, I could joke what it might be, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> yes, okay. uh, 
one final question to round up. I'm just uh, very curious. I think some of us are very curious uh, to round up your story about uh, your conversation with Long Ho. Uh, uh -huh. What would you like? The Noble Eightfold Path. Um, you know, you talked about uh, his views about right thought, uh, right speech. No what view. Are, <laughs> yeah. What are his views about right livelihood, right mindfulness, right concentration? Okay, well, what do we do for right mindfulness? We said silence. And then, or did we do it? We, okay, we were just playing around, right? Let me see. I think for the right mindfulness, we said it's like this. <laughs> and for right concentration, we said silence. For right livelihood, we didn't talk about it because we're monks. No livelihood, just be monks. <laughs> <laughs> well, the monks were laughing here. That one. <laughs> or but we, we didn't go into the three, right? Right action, right speech, right mindfulness. Uh, we just did the others. But it was playful. It wasn't dogmatic. So please don't quote me. <laughs> I'll be in trouble. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful um, uh, conclusion uh, to today's session, uh, Long Paul. Uh, there's a lot of food for thought and to uh, contemplate and practice on. Anu Modana, thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure. We'll close the session by paying respects. Shun Siang will lead, please. Uh, are we doing the meta chant, Long Paul? Yeah, why don't we? That's always nice. Yes, um, <laughs> Let's chant the met chant. You got it on the screen. There we go. <clears throat> um, we'll lead then, okay, Shinsu. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. <clears throat> Let them be able and upright. Straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, <clears throat> unburdened with duties, and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none. The great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state, let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with the life her child, her only child. So with a heart should one cherish all living beings radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies, <clears throat> upwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection 
This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, he is not born again into this world. Thank you so much, Long Paul. Okay, should uh, say. Let's all pay our respects with three bows together. <clears throat> First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Okay, everyone, be well. Nice to be with you. See you next time.